I'm Paul van Hooten. Let me spend two or three minutes to tell you about who I am, so that you know. I was born in a very small country, Belgium. You girls, you probably only know Belgium because of the chocolate. <laughs> Best chocolate in the world. The boys probably know it for the beer. Best beer in the world. Very small country. I did my medical school there. After medical school, I decided to go into research. The postdocs in America became, went back home, became <coughs> full professor and head of pharmacology, the science of the drugs. And when I was 41, I was a full professor, and I decided I couldn't stay f at the same place for the rest of my life, so I moved back to America. I worked for about 10 years at the Mayo Clinic, which you don't know, but is probably the most famous private clinic hospital and one of the most famous medical schools in the United States. Then I went after eight, nine, nine years. Yeah. I can only work somewhere for eight, nine years. After that, I become, you know, nervous. So I moved to Houston, Texas. I worked at Baylor College of Medicine, which is another, I shall say, rather famous place in the United States. Then I went to Paris for 10 years, where I directed drug discovery in a big company. And after 10 years again, I moved to Hong Kong, where I've been for the last nine years. So it's about time to move, but I'm getting a little old to keep on moving, you know. So I went to Hong Kong where I've been professor of pharmacology and for six years head of the department. Now I'm half retired in Hong Kong. I spent theoretically one third of my time in Chonbuk and I have other projects in uh, Riyadh, Denmark, Switzerland and Kuala Lumpur. So that's me my life. Not very interesting, but interesting to me, of course. <laughs> and my interest, I'm interested on two levels. One, as a basic scientist, <coughs> as a medical scientist, I'm interested in vascular biology. I've spent all of my professional life trying to understand how blood vessels work and how they contribute to the well-being of the body. And the first lectures will be exactly about that. That's one interest. Another interest I have is when, you know, as I told you, I directed drug discovery in a big company. I've been a consultant for the drug industry. So my other big interest is drug discovery and more maybe importantly or as importantly drug delivery because that's the same and this then ties me in with the people in Trondheim who are very good in those areas you see? so that's where we are but for us in those lectures whether that be physiology one or advanced physiology I don't care no we will go first over the role of vascular function in general then I probably, I haven't made up my mind, but I probably will teach you about the function of vascular smooth muscle, which I haven't done yet. And once we understand that, then we will move on to the endothelium, which is in vascular biology, the thing that I concentrated on for the last 30 years. So before you were born, I started. And so progressively we will we'll go through that, and then after that, well, if I still have classes to give, if you'd be still ask me to teach, you know, I will then find something further down the line, you know, but it will always be related to the cardiovascular system and the vascular system in particular because that's where my expertise is and this is the expertise can, that I can share with my Korean friends and my Korean students. Okay. The first thing that I would like to share with you, discuss with you, is role of vascular function in homeostasis. What is that?
you have, this is a monocellular being. You all know that organized life, I guess you know that, started in water. We come from water, from the sea. Okay, you know that? Everybody knows that? Okay. Now, originally, life started as very simple one cell structure. And those one cell live in the water. And I picked this example because you can see the little hairs here on the cell surface. It can swim. So it is in the water. If there is food, it can take it up, transforms it, and then has to get rid of the waste, like we do. We take food in. But we don't absorb, we don't use everything. And then, at the end of the day, we have to go to the toilet. It's the same principle here. This cell will pick up goodies, good stuff, food, oxygen, and will excrete the waste products. And if it breathes, CO2. And it does that. And when there is no food here, or too much crap here, it swims away and goes to another place. Okay? And so it can keep on living. Taking in, burning, wasting out, growing, reproducing, etc. So that's a very simple scenario when we are a one cellular beast. But as we grow multicellularly and our organism becomes is composed of more and more cells, we cannot do that. Theoretically we could take up food through our skin and release things through our skin and we do, but it's not enough to keep the organism going. So, homeostasis, and that comes from the Greek. Anybody of you has learned ancient Greek? Okay, who has not learned ancient Greek? Raise your hand if you have not learned ancient Greek. All the others have learned ancient Greek? I don't believe you. Who has not learned... Learn to react. Who has not learned ancient Greek? I have. You have? Who has not? Show me your hands. React. <laughs> there is no shame. Can you, there is no shame. You know. Nobody nowadays learns ancient Greek. Only the old dinosaurs like me have learned ancient Greek. Okay. In ancient Greek, homeos means the same and stasis means to stay, to stay the same. So homeostasis is this formidable organization in our body that keeps the surrounding of our cells optimal. If we go back for a second, if I find a button here, to this, this could be called the external milieu for the cell and the cell moves in and there now if we go back to our organism the external milieu is here outside me but there is an internal milieu with which the cells interact and this is what Claude Bernard great what I can say one of the founders, if not the fa father of modern physiology, called the interior milieu. Where is it? is it? Here, the milieu intérieur, as opposed to the external milieu. Let's read this together to make sure that you understand it. Homeostasis aims at maintaining the conditions for ourselves of our body satisfactory and optimal despite changes in the external world. So it gets cold outside, we have to keep warm. 
it gets warm outside, we have to keep our temperature. Temperature is a very good example of keeping, you know, homeostasis, and we will talk about it several times. This is achieved mainly by controlling the composition of the fluid surrounding the individual cells. So all our cells in our body are like this, except they cannot move. They're anchored to the extracellular matrix. And thus, they cannot move, so the only way to survive is to make sure that the fluid around them moves and remains under good conditions. This is maintaining the milieu intérieur. And we have to do that for all cells in the body. But, and normally, like today for everyone in the room, this is feasible. We can do that. But there are emergencies, and then there is an order of priority. If we look at all our body composed of all the organs, some are more important than others. It's like in society. We are all equal, but some are more equal than others. For example, I can survive if I lose a hand. It's not going to be pleasant. It's not going to be easy, especially if it is my right hand, because that's the one I used to write it and didn't. But I can survive. If I lose my head, I cannot survive. Or if I lose my heart, I cannot survive. See, so there is an order of priority. And throughout these lectures on homeostasis, I would like to, I will stress that. You know? We try to protect all cells, but when need comes, first the black box, then the pump, then the kidney, the lungs, and then the rest. Because we can survive quite a long time without, you know, blood going to the hand, we will not lose it. But we can only spare seconds without blood to the brain. Okay? Do we all understand that also in the background? I should test you and ask you to repeat what I just said. Will I do that? No, I will not be cruel. Okay? Good. So that's homeostasis in the broad sense. And how is that achieved? Well, just as my unicellular being exchanges continuously with the outside world for it, both in terms of taking up stuff and releasing stuff, we do the same. Every cell of our body does that continuously. You know? Amelostasis is achieved, and by the way, you will have access to those to those lectures, to the, the slides at the end. And I have tried, I usually don't use a lot of word slides, but the word slides give you the bottom line, what I would like you to remember. That's, the others is illustrating. Okay, good. So homeostasis is achieved through a complex number of exchanges between the body fluids and the individual tissue cells to make sure that enough foodstuffs are reaching the cells and that the cells are cleansed of the waste product. Where do that inside the body and then the fruits of the body have to exchange with the outside world and that happens in specialized areas depending on what we talk about. Exchange organs include the skin, the lungs, the gastrointestinal tract and the kidney. The lungs you can understand. We breathe in good air, well not in China and Hong Kong, but you know here in John is quite good. Soul is bottom line, borderline, you know. So <laughs> breathe in fresh air, we exhale air loaded with CO2. Okay? So that's one exchange. In the gastrointestinal tube. That's the whole thing from mouth to the other end. You know? That's one big tube. For the body, 
that is what is inside that tube is the external world is the external milieu yeah? and in the gastrointestinal tube we exchange and we take up what is good what we need sugar fat you know vitamins you know, a number of things but remember to our body what's inside the gut is the outside world and there we also take up and absorb water and that water will become the blood and that blood has to be laundered cleansed clean and that happens in the kidney in the kidney there are other things you know the bile and all of that but those are the major things what about the skin well, the skin plays a role. We lose things and fluid through the skin when we sweat. But what you have to remember, I think, at your stage in science is that the skin is the major radiator of the body. It's through the skin that we maintain one of the most important parameters, temperature. Okay? And so it goes in and out day after day. And that's why we are alive and enjoying life, I wouldn't say enjoying lectures, but enjoying life. Okay. And in that, so you have the body cells, and then the exchange things, and they have to be connected. There has to be a transport system. And that transport system is the cardiovascular system that pumps around around a very precious fluid, the blood, and the blood will go to the lungs, take up oxygen, will go to the gut, take up glucose, and bring it to wherever it has to be, glucose in the liver, for example, or other tissues. And the blood will also transport the waste to the kidney, and to the lungs, and sometimes to the skin. Okay. So, we cannot envisage the functioning of the body without the cardiovascular system. The cardiovascular system is pivotal because it transports blood, foodstuffs, waste products, and it links all part of the body with each other, but also with the milieu extérieur, with the external world. Do we understand that? Are you sure that you understand? No, I'm looking at you, not look behind you. Do you understand what I... Yes, you. <laughs> you understand? So if I ask a question at the exam about this, you will be brilliant, okay? Okay, good, good, I'm pleased. So what is the cardiovascular system? Well, it's a wonderful thing. Again, having spent... 40 years of my life trying to understand how it functions and having found some answers but many more questions I'm still a fascinating bit. So what is it composed of? Well it basically is composed of tubes, the blood vessels and a pump, the heart. But I should say two pumps because here it's put together you know we have the, the heart has two sides and again the heart will be covered by Professor Peter Kang so I will not uh, say too much about it but it has two sides a left side and a right side and you will hear from Professor uh, Kang that both the left side and the right side consist of a fast chamber the left atrium that is connected with valves to the left ventricle and here we have the right atrium that is connected to the blood vessels with valves again valves going into the so the valves you will learn that ensure that blood can only flow in one direction it cannot flow back that's always, and we'll see some of the valves when we talk later about the veins. Okay. 
So you have two pumps. And normally, if this were an engineering project, the two pumps would be separated. But now they're regrouped in one organ, the heart. But they should serve different circuits. The right, the left ventricle pumps blood into a large blood vessel, the aorta, that branches off in many arteries, and those arteries branch off in very small arterioles, and the arterioles branch in even smaller capillaries. And those capillaries are around the tissue cells. That's where those exchanges occur that I mentioned to you. Okay. Then the capillaries reform larger blood vessels, which we call the venules, and then those will go into larger still blood vessels, the systemic veins. Those are the blue things that you see on your hand. Mm -hmm. And those go into the right atrium. From there, through the valves in the right ventricle, and here the second pump then pumps it into the pulmonary, the long blood vessel. And here again we go, large pulmonary arteries, arteries, arterioles, capillaries. And here in the lung, the gas exchanges occur. And the blood that comes from the periphery, that is low in oxygen, that's why it is blue, you know, low in oxygen, goes back to the lung, and there CO2 is given to the air, and oxygen is taken up. The blood becomes red again, arterial blood, and flows to the left atrium, through the valves, in the left ventricle, and we go around, and around, and around, 60 or more times per minute. Calculate how many heartbeats during your life, you're young, I'm 71. Calculate how many times my heart has beaten. It's an incredible machine. No human design can do that. It's incredible. And I hope it's still solid, you never know, of course. But I still hope, uh, hope it will do the job for many more years. So, when we talk about the cardiovascular system, we have to talk about the left side, the arterial side, and the right side, the venous side. Venous side means carrying venous blood. Arterial side means carrying arterial blood. Low oxygen, high CO2. High oxygen, low CO2. Okay? Good. We talk about arteries and veins. We talk about capillaries, small blood vessels. Okay. So those are the tubes. So the role of the circulation maintain the internal milieu under livable condition. Again, order of priority, black box, pump, and the rest, kidney and the rest. Yeah. Okay, now let's complicate the matter a little bit. And here again we have our two pumps and the two systems. And here we go to the upper, the lungs. This is a separate circulation. This now shows you the aorta, the large blood vessel, and its most important branches going to the individual organs. So, for example, in the upper head we have the some glands, but in the upper part of the body it's mainly skin and muscle and the brain. Below the heart we have all the internal organs. See? The liver, the stomach, the intestine, the pancreas, endocrine glands, we we'll talk about those, the adrenals, we have the kidneys, and of course we have skin and muscle, etc. Okay. In the rule, there is only one artery branches 
into one capillary network and then that goes back to the veins, as I showed you. But in certain organs, there can be two circuits. And the most important one for you to remember at this stage, the ones are in the glomerulus, in the kidney, where we have, you'll hear about the kidney, where they have two capillary networks. One to filter in the glomerulus and one to reabsorb in the tubercles in the same organ, two successive networks. If we look at the intestines, it's a little bit complicated in that it, the blood, the venous blood goes to the liver, but the liver also receives blood, arterial blood. So venous blood goes from the gut, goes to the liver, loaded up with glucose, fat stuff, etc. The liver is the biochemical machine of our body, so it picks up all of that stuff, but for the liver cells to stay alive, they also need oxygen and all of that. So this comes from the special liver artery. Okay, just to illustrate that it is sometimes a little bit more complicated than straightforward. But we still have the basic principle, the aorta branches off in all those different branches, feeding all the organs with fresh blood. And after the passage through the liver, that's where the energy comes to the glucose, normally stored in the liver, and then the liver will release it in function of the needs of the organism. So it's a beautiful system. So, to summarize, the assembly of the system, to, oh, I didn't say that, that's very important. Let me go back a few slides. I told you those are two pumps. But if you look at it, there are two pumps ultimately on the same circuit. Because the, the left heart pumps the blood in the system, it goes to the veins and then goes into the right heart and to the lung. Those two pumps have to remain in balance. It's absolutely crucial that they pump exactly the same amount of blood. Otherwise, if the left pumps more than the right, the tissues will you know, initially swell up. And if the left pumps less than the right, the lungs will swell up in, in case of heart disease and then we draw in our own blood, you see. So it's, it's important, it's crucial that those two pumps remain at each moment in time pumping the same amount of blood. So the pumps, the two pumps have to be balanced. Most circuits are in parallel, as I showed you. There are two networks that you have to remember in the kidney and there is a portal system in the liver. There is also one in the hypothalamus, but I don't think that we want to bother about that today. Okay. So the pumps. <coughs> I said the pump here, but I immediately should correct and say the pumps, the two pumps. The one organ, two pumps. The heart. And I will not, although I love the heart, but I will not teach because I have to leave something for Professor Peter Kang. You know, so. Okay, so that's one aspect. So we have two pumps, and that pump around throughout our life. The lungs, main function, oxygenator. Yeah. To allow blood to take up oxygen and get rid of the CO2. Again, I believe that other teacher is that you, that's you, that... Professor Dong Mei Wu will teach you about the lungs. Okay, so I won't say anything. It's, it's a fascinating organ. And, well, so I will talk about the tubes, the blood vessels, and more specifically the tubes in the systemic circulation. I didn't define systemic circulation. Okay. Remember we have right, left, we have 
long circulation and then systemic circulation, the rest of the body. Whatever is not the lung is the systemic circulation. I may use the word without remembering that you don't know what I talk about. So, again, this would have been a good opportunity to interrupt me and to say, what do you mean by systemic circulation? If you don't understand something, you ask me. If you don't ask, you've understood. That's the deal that we have. So let's talk about the blood vessels. Well, basically, all the blood vessels have a similar structure. They consist of different layers. There is a lumen, it's a tube, and there are different layers of cells around that. The innermost one, that's Latin. Who has learned Latin? Nobody? Okay, good. Who has not learned Latin? Raise your hands. That's already a little bit better. <laughs> you have to be reactive, kids. Come on. <laughs> so, inside the blood vessel, there's one very thin layer of cells. It's like the lining here on the wall, you see, the tapestry. It covers all blood vessels. And it is the only layer that is there in all blood vessels. And all blood vessels consist, have an endothelium. And around the endothelium, some elastic tissue, the internal elastic membrane. That you find in all blood vessels. And then in function of the size of the blood vessel, more and more stuff is added. Okay? First, you have smooth muscle. We'll talk about the smooth muscle a little bit later, and I will, during this semester, teach specifically about the function of the smooth muscle. Interestingly, what you have to know is that in most blood vessels, the smooth muscle, those are spindle cells. As you see on this schematic here, they're arranged in a more or less circular way, helical way. So that if that muscle contract, the blood vessel shuts down. The smooth muscle contract, the blood vessel constricts. You understand that? Ah, you understood that. I can see that you understood. Good. You know, he's a little bit taller than the other, so his head sticks out. So I see him all the time. <laughs> Good. And of course, the more smooth muscle, the stronger the blood vessel can contract. Okay? Then, around that, we have another elastic tissue, connective tissue, membrane, and then we have tunica adventitia, which contains connective tissue, fat, nerves, etc. That's the basic structure. If we now cut through that, this would be the lumen, the endothelium, the elastic membrane. Here you see the smooth muscle in circular array the external elastic membrane, and here the fat, connective tissue, the nerves, etc. That's a basic structure. As I say, not all blood vessels have all the layers. The capillaries only have the endothelium, for example. The smaller blood vessels have very few smooth muscle. The large blood vessels have a very thick coat of smooth muscle. So how does that work? Basically, if you know electricity, you know Ohm's law. Voltage equals resistance. Oh, uh, hmm? yeah, it's the same. If you have a system where you pump liquid, there will be a resistance to the flow 
And depending on the flow, there will be a high or low pressure. I mean, it's fundamental physics. This is the basic law that governs the cardiovascular system. Pressure equals flow times resistance. Voltage equals current times resistance. Same thing. Very simple. P stands for pressure, and we'll talk in a moment about arterial pressure, systolic or diastolic pressure. F stands for flow. For example, when we get out of the heart, the amount of blood that is pumped per contraction by the heart, we call that stroke volume, what Professor Peter Gans will call that stroke volume, and he will tell you that cardiac output is stroke volume times beats. So if your stroke volume is 500 milliliter and you pump 100 times, you, know, you pump 50 liters. It's very simple. Something like that. So that's F. And then R stands for the resistance to flow offered by the vascular circuit. Every part of the system has a resistance to flow. The moment the blood comes out of the heart, it starts losing energy because it has to overcome the resistance. Yes. Again, to engineers, this is not difficult to explain. To medical students, it's sometimes very difficult to explain. You know, but it's a very basic principle of energy and loss of energy due to overcoming resistance. Okay. This is probably the most important schematic of this first set of lecture because it says it all. It explains it all. This illustrates who lives in the big tower big apartment tower. Who does? Nobody? Okay, don't tell me that you all live on the first floor of a building. <laughs> I will not believe you. Okay, so you know that in a big apartment building, if you live, I live on the 40, 42nd floor of an apartment building in Hong Kong. You know, that's where my apartment is in Hong Kong. Now, if I go to my bathroom and I open a faucet, water flows. I know that the guy who lives on the second floor, that it will flow too. Chances are that man flows a little bit slower than the guy on the first floor. Why? Because the pressure head is much bigger. But the whole system operates because on top of the building, there is a large water reservoir that maintains pressure in the system. We all understand that? And at each level of the system, the amount of fluid that is released when we open the faucet depends on that pressure, or this pressure, and the degree of opening of the faucet. We understand that? And of course, the higher the pressure, the more we can release. The bigger the flow will be for a given degree of opening of the faucet. This is the same principle as Ohm's law. It's exactly the same thing. And thus, if we go back here, let's go back to the second floor of my building. If the faucet is open a little bit, it trickles. If it opens a lot, it flows. Here, the resistance is high, thus the flow is low, because the pressure is constant. Everybody understands that? And this is how the body works. This is how the circulation works. We have a pump, and that represents this, a pump that will do all it can 
to keep the pressure here constant, then the system divides in different circuits, and depending on the organs, the faucets, and those are the arterioles, the small arteries, depending on the needs of the tissue, they will open or close. And thus, if the heart sustains the pressure here, the perfusion of the individual tissues will be perfectly matched to their needs, provided the needs decide on the degree of opening of the fossa. It's a very simple system. The only difference with my bathroom in Hong Kong is that if I take a shower, the water is lost to the drain. Now, we cannot afford that. So we have to recuperate the fluid and pump it back in. This is the venous reservoir, and somehow here we need two pumps of and the second pump then brings the fluid back into the system. Isn't that something? It's very simple. Functions marvelously well. And thus, to survive for a tissue, for the cells of our tissues to be like my first slide, you know, we need those cells to be able to generate signals that can match the opening of the faucet in function of their needs. Okay? And at the same time, homeostasis, we have to make sure that the pump can follow. Because if all those faucets open up, you know, the pump will have to pop more blood increase the flow so that the driving pressure remains adequate. Again, to physics students, this is not a difficult thing to explain. Hmm? B. B. What, here we have a constant pressure that goes to a part of the system and one faucet is open a lot a fluid goes through, this faucet is only partially open and very little, it's like in your bathroom, you know. If you have uh, two faucets, one in the vanity and one in the bathtub, yeah. you can open one full and the other at the same time just a little. It, you, you're adjusting the resistance and you faced it with a constant pressure. Now again, in a building, you have to maintain this, and this is where the water company comes in, you know, with another pump system to bring it up. So basically, the water company plus the inherent pump of the building, that's the right hand, the right side, the right heart of my building, so to speak. You understand now? Yeah. Okay, good. Ah, I had a question, I'm happy. <laughs> so that's a key slide. If you know that, you already understand the basic functioning of the body. Because what we will spend time is discussing how this can be regulated and how this can be maintained. Let's now go through the different blood vessels and look at some of their characteristics that will make you and help you, I hope, understand how the system functions. And the first thing we have to talk about is the diameter and the resistance. Let me see what I have next. Now I'll go. The diameter and the resistance. I'm not sure this slide is at the optimal point in my presentation. Anyhow, let's take it, let's take them as I come. Thank you very much. Diameter. The aorta, we talk about humans here, not rats, rabbits, or mice. You know? 
humans, or pigs, it's about the same. The aorta, the large blood vessel that leaves the left ventricle, is about two and a half centimeter in diameter. The vena cava, the large blood vessel that returns the venous blood to the right atrium, is about three centimeters in diameter, a little bit larger. And then they branch progressively and debranch progressively. If you look at most large arteries, they are about 0.5 centimeters in diameter. We go to the arterioles, they are about 30 micrometer in diameter. We go to the capillaries, very small, six micrometer. And then we go back, you know, 20 micrometers for the venules, 0.5 for the average vein, you know, and then the big vein. And of course, we will see that later on. You can understand, again, as a with a physics background, that resistance will be function of diameter. We'll come back to that later. That's easy to understand. And thus, if we look at resistance, we see that resistance originally in the large arteries is not the risk, it increases, but it really peaks at the level of the arterioles. The arterioles are the faucets. They will basically determine how much blood flows to a given tissue. And then, at the level of the capillaries, it precipitously decreases, and then you know, the resistance becomes lower and lower to be relatively low at the venous side of the circulation. This slide also shows you the wall-to-lumen ratio. The wall-to-lumen ratio gives you an indication of the thickness of the blood vessel. And the wall-to-lumen ratio, you know, the relative wall-to-lumen ratio, again, is the thickest in the small arterioles because from a relative point of view, they contain much more smooth muscle because they have to regulate the diameter of the faucet. Okay? Everybody understands that? Yes. You understand? Yeah, good. Thank you. I'm so pleased. Okay. Another very important parameter is pressure. And here, you notice that I've said pressures in the circulation because it's not constant. That really is very different with my apartment in Hong Kong, in the sense that there the pressure is constant. Here it is constant when it leaves the heart. Then it goes down precipitously. Actually, in my apartment this is also the case, but because the pipes are very large, you see, we don't really feel it very much now. It's only the hydrostatic pressure that comes. The heart, as I said, is a pump. So it pumps and a pump, by definition, pumps and does not pump, pump and does not pump. You know, there are constant pumps, but we don't have one of those in our body. Hmm? So we have a cyclic pump. And we have alteration, alternations of contractions and relaxations. And the contractions in our cardiovascular jargon we call the systole, systole, contract, and the relaxation we call diastole. Again, from the Greek, you know, contract and relax. You know? And thus, if we look in the ventricle, the ventricle will be relaxed contract, relaxes again. So the pressure will go from near zero to about 120 millimeters of mercury if you are a normal human being. I mean, if you don't have high blood pressure or low blood pressure, that's the average value. This would be in the ventricle, the systolic pressure, uh, excuse me, the diastolic pressure, this is the systolic pressure. 
Okay. Good. So we have a pump. Now when we look to the blood vessels, we, the first thing that we notice if we measure blood pressure in the large arteries or in the aorta is that during diastole, the pressure does not fall all the way back. And you can understand that. You remember on the schematic that I showed you, there was smooth muscle, elastic tissue. So suddenly we pump blood in an elastic tissue. We'll come back to that later. We'll, I'll say that more because it's... Important. So it's not a fixed iron tube. It's an elastic tissue. So what will happen if we pump suddenly at great pressure fluid into it? What will happen with an elastic tissue? Yep, exactly. It will dilate. And then when the pressure is not generated anymore, it will recoil. But it will not recoil to zero. Okay? So in the blood vessels, in the large arteries, we talk about systolic pressure in the aorta. At the beginning, it's identical to the ventricular pressure. And then as the system recoils, we come to a lower value, which we call diastolic. And when we calculate the pressure for a individual, we usually have what we call the mean pressure. Now in terms of knowing whether you have hypertension or not, what I'm interested in is your mean pressure. Again, it's not of importance for this group, but in medical terms, this is a very important concept that mean pressure is the thing that you have to look at, you know, most of the time. Okay. Now there isn't something we go down the stream then, and progressively, we see that the mean pressure goes down as there is more and more resistance. So we lose more and more of the energy generated by the heart to overcome the resistance. Okay? Do we understand that? There is something very peculiar that in large artery, the systolic pressure can be bigger than in the aorta because of the elastic characteristic. But I don't want to get into that, you know. You, if you ever hear about it, you may remember that I've mentioned it, but we don't go into that. You know. That's a little bit beyond what I want to achieve during those classes. So, you see, as we lose energy, the pressure becomes smaller and smaller to be relatively small at the level of the capillaries and then smallest in the veins. We come to the right atrium, diast diastole, systole, and then the blood goes to the pulmonary blood vessels. Now, a characteristic of the pulmonary circulation is it is an independent pump and it operates at a much lower pressure. And if, you're, if you reflect on it, you can understand why. Because the lung is the interface between the blood and the air. You don't want too much pressure in that system, you know, because that would facilitate, as we will see later, transition of fluid to the alveoli. And the last thing you want in alveoli is fluid, because then you cannot breathe. See? So we have to operate on a much lower regimen of pressure in the lungs, and we do. And if something goes wrong and this pressure goes up, then we're in deep trouble. We call that pulmonary hypertension. And maybe later on in advanced, yeah, you may hear of that. You know. Okay? So, and again, there's pressures in the circulation. That's why when you talk about a pressure in the circulation, you have to define what it is. I get always nervous when people say blood pressure. What blood pressure? This one? This one? This one? You have to define. Arterial blood pressure, pulmonary arterial blood pressure, you know, venous blood pressure. Those are all blood pressures, but they're different. So the pressure varies, but in the rule, it's generated there and goes down, and then there is a little kick to get it back to the lung and for the blood to be cleared 
from CO2 and to pick up oxygen. What do you have to remember? Pressure is phasic, systolic high and diastolic low. Pressure dropped the most over the small capillary vessel, pre-capillary vessel, because the resistance is the highest. Pressure is approximately six times lower in the pulmonary circulation. And then, you know, in medical terms, the important parameter is the mean pressure. Although, to be honest, this is revisited right now, and people talk a lot about systolic and diastolic pressure, but it doesn't matter. For you, I really should take that off that slide. Okay. So, resistance, diameter, pressure. And out of that, we can calculate flow, if we know those two things. Let's now go through individual sections and talk about what they do. The aorta and the large arteries are what we call the windkessel vessels. And you have no idea what a windkessel is. So let me go back, actually. A windcastle, anybody lives on a farm or is one of your family living far away from the cities? Anybody? You all live in the city? Now, if you live far away in a farm, I don't know what this is the situation in, uh, in Korea, but in the United States or even in Europe, if you live far away from the city, there is no running water. There is no city water. Okay? How do you get water? Yeah. So you, you, you drill, you know, a hole in the earth until you get to the water level and then you pump. Okay? In the old days, you would, uh, you know, you would do it with uh, you know, buckets and all of that, but now we do it with a pump. Now, the water that is pumped from the, that well goes into a reservoir like this. Now, what, is, what do you notice on this reservoir? Closed. Hmm? Closed. It's closed, one thing. What else? On this drawing, use your eyes. What do your eyes tell you? There's fluid here in a closed reservoir, but it's not full. Why is it not full? Because we want a layer of air there, because the pump will come from the well, pump it in, and we don't want this to come out pulsatile as from the heart. We want it to be smooth, to be steady. And thus we have a layer of air here that can be compressed and can expand again. That's what we call a windcastle. That's the definition of a windcastle in pumping water. You know, it's not a medical term. But we use it for our arteries because as I told you, this is exactly what the aorta does in the large arteries. When the heart pumps, they dilate and they recoil. And this ensures the flow of blood even in between contractions of the ventricles. So the large arteries act as the deep pulsator of the heartbeat. Is that important? Well, it is important because it makes sure that irrespective of contraction relaxation of the heart, fluid goes and can flow through the faucets. And I already can tell you this is particularly important for one organ. Which organ could that be? Hmm? Hmm? 
No. Which organ will find it very difficult to be perfused during the systole? Which organ will be very, very hard during the systole, you know, during this peak here? We'll, we'll come back to that later, but let me already say so. When the muscle contracts, no blood goes through it. So the heart itself, at this stage here, when it contracts, it's very hard. No blood can go to it. So we have to make sure that when it relaxes, blood flow can continue and go to it. You see? And that's one of the reasons why this is absolutely essential to maintain a good diastolic pressure. Otherwise, we cannot irrigate our own heart, you see. Okay? So, Windkessel function, from that point of view, is very good. Oh, this is one that I will skip. skip. So, the large arteries are the depulsator of the rhythmic bloodstream that leaves the left ventricle, and this smoothens tissue perfusion and ensure continuous perfusion during diastole. This is particularly important for the coronary circulation. It's very important. That is compressed during systole. We'll come back to that later because, you know, this is a very important thing that you have to remember. And this is why, for example, if you have a heart disease, one of the ways to improve your heart condition is to lower the beating frequency of the heart. Because that gives more time for the astole to send blood to the heart. Again, that's second semester. But, yeah, okay. The resistance vessels. So the large arteries are the windkessel vessels. The small arteries and the arterioles are the resistance vessels. And again, if we go back a few slides, we can understand that because most of the resistance is lost in those. Most of the resistance is present in those blood vessels. As I said, this resistance will determine ultimately the degree of opening and thus the arterioles and the small pre-arterioles are the faucets that determine blood flow. Please remember that, that's crucial. And if we look at the circulation again and introduce that concept, we have again our left heart pumping blood and then in function of the resistance, there will be more or less blood going to the different organs. And as I say, the degree of opening of those faucets will be determined by the metabolic needs of the tissue. So, for example, if we digest, well, we need blood to go to our guts, you know, to digest. And that's why people always say, well, you better not exercise immediately after a meal. Yeah. It's not that your health, health is in danger, but you know, you want at that time to optimize. And if you have a heart condition and you exercise immediately after a meal, there you may get into trouble. See? Because there's a limited amount of blood that can be pumped and go to the organs. You know, we can beef up the heart, we can accelerate the heart, we can get more blood out of the heart. Professor Peter Gans will explain that to you. But there is a limit. There is only so much that we can do. And uh, the same in the limbs, you know, if we suddenly exercise, suddenly all the metabolic needs of our skeletal muscle in the legs, for example, will augment all the faucets will open up and we will want more blood going to those skeletal muscles otherwise we cannot do the work that we want to do. So, very simple equation. Faucets, arterioles. 
And what is determining the degree of opening will come to that, but how does resistance go in terms of diameter? Well, again, this is a very simple physics law. It's nothing special for the cardiovascular system. It's what you must have learned in physics. It's Poisson's equation. That is, ultimately, that the resistance, if flow goes through that, uh, through that blood vessel, that the resistance offered by the blood vessel is determined by the length of the tube, and we know that. If you take a garden hose with a fixed diameter, you connect it to the faucet, and then you measure the pressure at the end of the hose, it will be much lower. And the longer the hose, the less the pressure will be at the end. The more resistance you have, the more you lose. You know? And it's also a function of the diameter. But the important thing here that you have to remember is that it's not whereas resistance is directly related to the length. It's a simple relationship. The diameter, as you've learned in your physics courses, or should have learned, is related to the force power of the diameter. So if a diameter changes you know, by half, the resistance will increase much higher than double. It will be to the fall, it will be to the fourth power. So this implies, do you all understand this equation? So the resistance, if I push fluid through this tube, there will be resistance and I will lose energy. And the longer the tube, the more energy I will lose. If you don't believe me, try it with a short tube and a big tube and push through it and you will immediately feel the difference. And the diameter tells me that if the tube is small, I have to push a lot harder to get the same amount of fluid. We all know that intuitively. The key here is changes in diameter impact on resistance to flow to the fourth power. That means that small changes in diameter can have very important consequences in terms of resistance. So to increase the resistance, you don't necessarily have to shut down the blood vessel. You know, you can modulate small changes in diameter, small changes in the degree of contraction of the muscle cells in the blood vessel wall will impact profoundly on resistance. We all, we all understand that? Okay, no questions? Good. And those in this here, those are the guys that will decide that. Because they're arranged in a circular fashion, and if they contract, the diameter will be reduced with an impact of the fourth power to the change in radius on resistance. If they dilate, the opposite will be the case. Okay? This is a vascular smooth muscle cell, but since I intend this year to talk about vascular smooth muscle, we come back to the proteins and how it works. You know, it's uh, like in every muscle cell, I'm sure you'll hear about that in the courses of uh, Professor Peter Gang when he talks about the myocardium. You know, we have contractile proteins, there's a biochemical reaction, and as the biochemical energy is provided, the, the proteins glide, slide into each other, and pool. Yeah. A very simplified way of describing contraction. We'll come back to that later. But that's the idea. You, know? you provide energy, I slide, and that pull. You see. Okay. Uh, again, they can do that, those vascular smooth muscle, because they can respond to a number of signals, and we'll come back to the signals later that are either receptors or ion channels or enzymes or transporters, all of that plays a role. Ultimately, we will see that the important thing is the calcium concentration in the vascular smooth muscle cell that will determine 
the level of contraction. Don't try to understand this schematic now. We will come back to that later. So what do you need to remember? Peripheral resistance. Peripheral resistance is determined mainly at the level of pre-capillary arterioles. The individual resistance are determined by the need of the tissue cell. And by maintaining arterial blood pressure constant, the adequate perfusion is assured, insured in function of the needs of the tissue. So we're back to my water level and the faucet. We need to do two things. Make sure that the degree of opening is function of the needs of the cell in a given tissue. That we need to do. And we need to maintain the pressure head sufficiently so that we can, you know, provide enough blood. Okay. Exchange vessels. Remember I showed you where we had those vessels that became smaller and smaller? And eventually we came to the capillaries. The capillaries are the exchange vessels. And they are so because the velocity of the bloodstream is the lowest and because they are the thinnest. They only have one endothelial cells and elastic membrane. Okay, velocity. Why do I bring that in? Remember, we have a pump here that will pump, let's say, five liters per minute. That is branched over all those branches and eventually will come back five liters per minute. Has to remain in balance. Can't afford not to be in balance. Has to be in balance. Okay? Now, as the blood flow is distributed over the different parts of the system, here five liters per minute, here five liters per minute, now over the totality of each of those sections, five liters per minute. There's no way around that. You know, pure physics. It has to be 5 liters per minute. Okay. Now, here we flow at 5 liters per minute. That's a very high speed. That's a very high velocity because we have only a diameter of 2.5 centimeters. Here, the total cross-sectional area, the total surface here, if we add all those six microns in the body, all together, we come to a very high cross-sectional area. Hmm? Yeah. Capillaries are... Yeah? You have a question? No, sir. Although the diameter of the individual blood vessels is decreasing, if you add all of the capillaries together, you have a much larger cross-sectional area, you know, 5,000 here in square centimeters, whereas the aorta is two and a half, and, you know, you understand? So, so here, at the outcome of the heart, the blood, five liters come at, an inc at a very high speed, and then it progressively slows down to be the slowest at the level of the capillaries. Yes. It's to facilitate transport, of course. Imagine a belt in an airport yes, where you want to take off your luggage. If the belt goes slowly, you can do that. If the belt were to go like this, you could not pick up your luggage. I mean, simplistic representation, but that's what we talk about. You know. We by s the slowing down of the blood, we greatly facilitate the exchanges. And the capillaries are the place where those exchanges take place. And thus, flow velocity, the slower velocity in the smaller blood vessels, provides optimal time for exchanges, gases, foodstuffs, waste products at the level of the tissue. And thus we start off with a very rapid bloodstream. And you've seen that in movies, you know, when people cut big arteries, it goes all over the screen. You know? And then at the level of the tissues, it's very slow. If 
if you cut yourself and you have a very little wound here, it will drip, you know, it will not <laughs> come out. You have to cut the large arteries for it to be really impressive, okay? And that's a key thing, because it gives time to establish that milieu interior. So all our cells are surrounded by fluid. And in that fluid are all the things that I need, but also all the things that I want to get rid of. And that fluid around the cells has to be cleaned continuously. Now, so our body is an ongoing dishwasher. You know, we wash all the time, okay? And so the, the circulation brings this internal milieu in contact with the external world through the blood. Good. So things have to move from in the cell to the outside of the cell, and we'll learn more about that later. And from the intercellular fluid, the fluid between the cells, to the blood. We all understand that? Good. Now, how does that work? <coughs> well, if you have some idea about chemistry, you know that if you make a solution, if you have a pot with water, and you drop something in it, nature looks for equilibrium, you know? Very rapidly, if you give it time, the concentration of the new substance, if it is soluble, will soon be the same in your pot of water, okay? So that's a simple, simple thing. If you now bring that water in contact with another pot, and instead of just making an open contact so that everything can diffuse freely, but between the two you bring in a separation with holes. Again, the fluid, the two fluids, will try to equilibrate. Okay? Good. So it's very simple. Now, what we have between the blood and the body fluids, the external, the intercellular fluid, is at the level of the capillaries, the endothelium. And the endothelium is like a membrane, very thin, and it has holes between it. So if the holes are very big, like in the liver, you know, things can almost freely diffuse. So the blood comes, the holes are not big enough to let the cells go through it, but the sugar here, for example, picked up from the gut, comes into the liver and can freely diffuse. In other areas, the holes are much smaller, and then the endothelium behaves as a semi-permeable membrane. So not everything goes through. There are laws gov governing that. And in parts of the system, like in the brain, the contacts between the endothelial cells are so tight that nothing can go through except it has to pass through the endothelium. And passage again will be complicated by the fact that we have one membrane here the content of the endothelial cells, another membrane there. Now, in many instances, the transfer through that membrane will be not only between the holes, but through the membrane itself, and often there are active systems that pick up stuff from the blood and transport it. 
you know, to the other side. Okay? So there are many possibilities. But in all of that, a key aspect is the fact that the fluid has to go to. Now, the fastest way to wash something is to rinse it. You understand that? So somehow we want around our tissue cells to continuously wash them. Okay, how can that happen? Well, this brings two motions here. There are powers here, forces, that will try to get fluid to the tissues and forces that will get try to keep fruit of the, out of the tissues or push it back to the blood. It has to be like that, otherwise it cannot be washed. So somehow, ideally, at the arterial side of the circulation, you want the fluid, you know, to, here is the capillary, you want the fluid to go to the tissue, at the venous side you want it to come back to the blood. Here, load it up with oxygen, load it up with glucose, load it up with all the good things, you know. Here, washed away with the dirt. Do we understand that? Good. Now, what are the forces that are there? Well, because there are holes between the endothelial cells, again, think about a garden hose. You know? If you want, I don't know whether you have many lawns here, but I'm sure you've seen movies where there are hoses to water lawns or flowers, you know. Those are long tubes and there are little holes on the side and thus when you open the faucet, water comes, sprinkles out of the little hoses, okay? What is the force that, do, that pushes that? That's the pressure that you apply, you know, on the water. So if you open the faucet, remember my water tower, yeah. we have a lot of pressure there, and, you know, the fluid will flow through the hose, lose power, lose because of the resistance, but as long as there is enough pressure, water will sprinkle. If the tube becomes too long, it stops then, of course. Okay. Well, we have that in our system too. There are holes, and we have pressure on the blood. Pressure generated by the heart. You know? We call that arterial blood pressure, or in, at the level of the capillary, we call it you know, hydrostatic pressure, or you know, it doesn't matter. That's the power, hydrostatic pressure. So that will push liquid into the tissues. Okay, now what is the opposing force? Well, this here, this fluid, not only contains sugar, freely soluble, but contains, like the blood, a number of substances that are there and cannot be freely diffusible, that keep attracting the best way, to, you know, I want to get to you the concept of colloid osmotic pressure. If you have in a solution colloids that can be sugars, that can be proteins, now that can be a number of things, not ions, but proteins, that will attract water. Let me show you that. This is where my sugar comes in. Remember, uh, I don't know, some of you saw me collect sugars the other day. Uh, it may not work because we're far away, but... <coughs> Dirty boy. Let me illustrate colloid osmotic pressure. What I did here is I put a little coffee on top of this cup. Now, if I take this sugar which is a high concentration of sugar, no water. And I put it in there, what will happen? 
Well, you see, that's sucking up fluid. It's the same in our body fluid. We have solutions of protein, we have everything, and they attract water. And of course, we have the same permeable membrane, and on the one side is a solution with colloid osmotic pressure, and on the other side is also a solution with colloid osmotic pressure. And an equilibrium will be solved. The same with the pressure. The, oh, here goes my experiment. Now, what am I going to do with this mess I'm leaving here? It's not going to be too bad. So, the, the same with the pressure. If, you know, <laughs> as we pump fluid into the tissue, the pressure in, in between the cell will increase. And eventually we will have equilibrium. Nature is always a matter of equilibrium. And you know that from physics, physical forces in the chemical forces we probably see people. Okay. If you understand that, now you can understand capillary exchanges. The blood arrives here, loaded up with oxygen and food stuff, but contains proteins, contains has a certain colloid osmotic pressure which at the level, at the beginning of the capillary, can be, and there are ways to measure that, let's give it the ballpark figure, figure of 25 millimeters of mercury. So that's the solution that tries to attract water, okay? At the same time, whatever is left of the energy generated by the heart will give us an hydrostatic pressure here, an arterial blood pressure at the level of the capillary level of 32 millimeters of mercury. Thus, hydrostatic pressure is bigger than colloid osmotic pressure and hydrostatic pressure wins. Fluid goes to the tissue. And what happens then? Well, as the blood flows through the capillary, it progressively loses power, res resistance. So it loses energy. And thus, at the end of the capillary, the hydrostatic pressure is smaller. Yet here, we have a solution that loses fluid to the intercellular fluid. Thus, progressively, the colloid osmotic pressure inside the capillary becomes bigger. You understand that? And thus, fluid goes back into the blood. Very simple, very elegant, works wonderfully well. And thus, we continuously wash all the cells of our body. And this is almost perfectly in balance. But there is a little bit more that goes to the tissue than goes back in the blood. And this then goes back to the circulation through the lymphatic system. Those are, I haven't mentioned those, those are tubes consisting mainly of endothelium and a few smooth muscle cells that contain valves and their function is to slowly bring that excess fluid back to the circulation. But not shown on those schematic, on the course of those and those vessels will become larger and larger too and there are conglomerations of cells in certain areas those are the lymph nodes. Have you heard of the lymph nodes? This is loaded up with white blood cells that have to kill. If in this tissue there are germs, microbes, they will be washed away by the limbs and killed by the cells in the lymph nodes. 
That's why if you have an infection, your lymph nodes will swell. That's why if you have a cancer, you know, the lymph nodes will try to do something about it if the cancer cells come. It's a further defense. So this little extra fluid that doesn't go back straight to the circulation, that goes in the lymphatic circulation, plays an essential role because it cleans the tissue in a different way. It cleans, it takes away invasions, invaders. Okay? Do we understand that? Everybody understands? Okay, now we can go further. So this is a, a, a key function, of course, of the capillaries, and it keeps us going all the time. The, as I said, the, the water here is loaded up with oxygen, loaded up with sugar, loaded up with everything that the cells need to stay in life. And continuously, through this exchange, between colloid osmotic pressure and hydrostatic pressure. Okay. Let's now try to put together the function of the arterioles, the capillaries, and the next set. The next set of blood vessels are the very thin veins and the small veins, the venules. And those veins contain smooth muscle too. Now, let's assume that a tissue starts to work. We'll see that in a few moments. Their arterioles will dilate. What will the consequence be of that? Well, the diameter will increase. As you remember, if the diameter is bigger, Poiseuille's will have less resistance. Thus, we lose less pressure. Thus, my hydrostatic pressure, you know, oh, it doesn't work. Oh, oh yeah, it worked. <laughs> Thus, my hydrostatic pressure will be bigger. My colloid osmotic pressure will be the same. But yet, there is more pressure, so we can get more fluid to the tissues, more oxygen, more glucose, more good stuff. And because the tissues are active, they will generate more crap, so we can wash away more of that. It's very simple. Now, if nothing happens, then the veins will permit the blood to go further away, and thus everything is washed out. And thus by decreasing or opening the arterioles, remember, the fossas, this will generate more flow, but will also permit optimal exchanges by increasing the hydrostatic pressure only in the tissues that need it. Okay? Understood? Good. Okay. Now, we will talk later about substances that can alter the function of the blood vessel today or tomorrow or whenever, you know. I've decided in those lectures I'm not going to look at the watch, I will try to make sure that you understand what I'm talking about. And certain substances affect the different parts of the microcirculation. This part, the arterioles, the capillaries, and the small veins, we call the microcirculation, the small blood vessel. And one, a prototypical cell or product that can do that is histamine and it is released by histamine containing cells, mast cells, a number of cells. And it doesn't matter now why it is released. I want you to understand what happens. 
And the best example of a strong stimulus for the release of histamine is either a mosquito bite or if you scratch yourself. What happens then? What happens if you scratch yourself? Histamine will be released in your skin. What happens? Or if a mosquito bites you? It swells and it's red. Okay? Now try to understand how that can happen. Well, histamine will come and cause the arterial to dilate. We'll see later, not this time I think, but we'll see later that this is because histamine works on the endothelium and causes the endothelium to release vasodilator substances. Okay? So the arterioles dilate. Consequence, hydrostatic pressure goes up. At the same time, histamine increases the number of holes between the endothelial cells. So not only is the pressure up, but we have a less, you know, close membrane, a more permeable membrane. Thus more fluid goes up. And at the same time, histamine closes down the venules. So this also increases, you know, pressure in, you know, keeps the fluid inside the tube. And thus as a consequence of that, you know, there is a massive exudation, a massive loss locally of fluid to the tissue and it swells. And why is it red? Who knows why it is red? If you scratch, why is it red? Why does histamine code redness? Red color, like those chairs. Why? No idea? Because of this? It vasodilates, so there is more blood, more oxygenated blood. The red color in our body comes from blood, from blood loaded up with oxygen. So histamine causes dilatation, redness, increased capillary pressure, increased capillary permeability, swelling. Histamine is a wonderful example of a substance that affects the microcirculation profoundly. But it's not the only one. I could talk about serotonin, and I think I picked the example of bradykinin that we will talk about too later. Now, in this, let me show you how one does those experiments. Now, we look at the little animal. In this instance, a hamster, beautiful little hamster. It's not dead, you know, it sleeps. Don't worry, no hard feelings, no feelings against animal research, please. And we the hamster has a cheek in which it can load up stuff, you know, so that when it goes around, it finds food and it loads it up in its cheek and then it can bring it back to its nest later on to keep for winter, okay? And there is a very thin membrane there that we can visualize. And we can look at it and we can inject something that is opaque so that under a microscope we see it very well. Okay, this would be the blood vessels of the Amster cheek pouch with under control condition with simply the opaque contrast medium in it so that we can have a good look. And now the only thing that we will do is in this system inject bradykinin. I could lie to you and say histamine would be the same. You know, and then we see this. You see how the contrast medium, this would be controlled, that's the picture that you saw a moment ago. We give bradykinin, and here all the capillaries start to leak, illustrating the impact of this opening of the arteriole, increase in capillary permeability, 
shutting down of the venules. Fluid is leaking to the tissue. Now, if this is a very small area, it's of no consequence. But if this happens throughout the body during a strong allergic or anaphylactic reaction, this can become a big problem, of course, that you can understand. Okay? I have already mentioned lymphatic drainage as a way to finally get everything out. And Dong Mei, I know, I should have more slides about lymphatic drainage. I always promised Professor Dong Mei Wu that next year I will have more slides about lymphatic drainage, and then I'm so busy that I remember that when I'm on the plane to Korea and it's too late. You see, I don't have the slides. So to summarize, an essential part of the function of the, of the circulation, actually the ultimate goal of the circulation, exchanges. Hmm? Permeability per se of the capillary wall varies very tight in the blood-brain barrier because we don't want stuff to get into the brain in, except black box, computer, hmm? ultimate priority. There we, we want to really tightly control what goes into the brain. You see? Big holes in the liver because there we want to take everything out. That comes from the gut because it's in the gut that we take up the goodies. You know? The chocolate, all of that comes in the gut so that has to go to the liver. The balance between hydrostatic and osmotic pressure of the blood and the interstitial fluid governs the movements of waters and solute, solutes, nutrients, waste products at the capillary level, going in at the arterial side, going out at the venous side. The above balance changes with variations in diameter of pre and post capillary vessels. And again, if you think about your, uh, your hose with holes, if the hole if the hose is bigger, there will be more fluid going, provided the pressure stays constant. And if you close the end, you know, there will also be more fluid going to, you know, because you will, you will interfere with the normal process. The little excess fluid transiting from the blood to the tissues is drained by the lymphatics. Active mechanism transporters contribute for specific molecules. And I don't talk about the gas exchanges because that will be hopefully covered by... You, you will talk about a little bit, but... And those are purely physical. That's no complication there. Oxygen goes from high to low. CO2 goes from high to low. I mean, that's very simple. Oh, it's a little bit... In terms of hemoglobin comes in and complicates the matter a little bit, but Professor Dong Wu will uh, explain that. Remember, in your bathroom, the water that comes out of the faucet runs away. We cannot afford that. So we need to have a reservoir. That reservoir is the venous system that takes up the fluid from the tissues, dirty as it may be, and then brings it to where it needs to go and it needs to go that was a very complicated maneuver for little reason it needs to go to the, it goes to the veins and the veins thus are the reservoir reservoir is the right term because if we calculate where the blood is in our body. We can calculate that 15%, we have about 5 liters blood. I probably have more than you. That you know, is, <laughs> depends on the body weight, of course. Yeah. So, if we calculate where blood is, 15% is in the heart and the lungs. 15, 5 to 10 percent is in the rest of the circulation. 
70% is in the veins. Now, again, this is a very important concept. If we look at what the veins will do, why is that important as reservoir? Well, we have this pump here, actually two pumps in sequence, but they have to pump the same amount of blood, so from a hemodynamic point of view, we consider heart and lung as one pump. Okay? We know there are two sides and all of that, but only one pump. Do I hear a phone go there? No, must be outside. Good. Now, the heart will pump blood. It will pump blood, but each contraction, that will be Professor Peter Kang's lecture, we call that the stroke volume, that's one contraction. And the heart does that at a certain heart rate, certain rate, heart rate, you know, in rest, 70 depending on, you know, it can be 50 if you're very lucky and have very low heart rate, you know, 50 to 70 at rest but can go up to 150, 160, even more sometimes. Okay? And the flow or the cardiac output is heart rate multiplied by stroke volume. That means that if you want to increase cardiac output, you can do it in two ways. You can augment heart rate and keep the same stroke volume or you can keep heart rate the same and increase stroke volume. And what we usually do is a combination of the two. Faster, more pumping, more blood per contraction, up to a certain limit. Ultimately, that means that at the moment, let's assume we're not totally restful, then the system is, you know, perking along, pumping. Now suddenly we want, and we'll see that later, we want to pump more blood. Well, that blood has to come from somewhere. And if we suddenly need more blood per time unit, the system that feeds into the heart has to be able to adjust. So the reservoir will be, you know, if we always were using the same stroke volume, then these could be rigid pipes and it would go round and round and round. But if we want suddenly to pump more, more blood, more blood has to come into the heart. So the filling pressure has to be augmented, has to be adjusted. And that is the major function of blood volume, content, and the container. The container that contains most of our blood volume is an active container. It will adjust to make sure that at each moment in time, enough blood goes to the heart to generate the necessary cardiac output. And we'll see examples of that later. But for example, if you start running, we will see that your brain will already tell to your heart to go faster even before you start moving. Yeah? You will call that central command probably tomorrow. At the same time, we will have signals to the veins to say, come on, make sure that the heart has enough blood. Otherwise, you know, it will not be able to accelerate. Hmm? Illustrating the interaction between the different parts of the cardiovascular system. Now, if you look at that, we have to dissociate between different parts of the system. Let me see where I have my little guy there. Okay. 
if you look at, I will say that repeatedly, if we look at the venous system, the arterial side is dominated by the beating of the heart, but there also are simple hydrostatic matters. You know, the arterial blood pressure in our foot is the sum of the pressure generated by the heart plus the hydrostatic column of blood. We have columns of blood here that are complicating our life. The same at the venous side of the circulation. This is of particular importance for big mammals and particularly important for mammals, humans, that stand up. When we wake up in the morning, I don't know whether you like to wake up in the morning, I don't like to wake up in the morning, you know, when the alarm went this morning, and hmm, say, I want to stay in bed. And this is not, you know, this is true for our whole body. It's a formidable, dangerous thing to do, to stand up in the morning. Because as we lay down, the center of gravity of the body is here. So as we lay down, there are very small hydrostatic changes in pressure in our body. But the moment we stand up, we start negative pressure to have a problem with maybe under-perfusing the brain and over-perfusing the feet, which is not exactly our order of priority, as I told you. So standing up is a big problem. And in particular for the, for the veins, it is a big problem because they contain a lot of volume. So the hydrostatic pressure when we stand up will tend to push blood in our lower limbs. Okay. Good. Let's go back to where I was a few moments ago. Thus, if we consider the function of the venous system as an active component in circulatory control. A key thing is we must be able to adjust the return of blood to the heart irrespective of changes in hydrostatic pressure. So our balloon that will adjust volume return to the heart has to escape hydrostatic pressure. So what part of the venous system can do that? If you think about what I just said looking at my little man standing up. Where is the center of gravity? Here. And does the active component of, for the return of heart, of blood to the heart, are the veins in our abdomen, because they are close to the center of gravity, and they do not, or suffer much less from changes in hydrostatic pressure. So even if I stand up, I want to contract my veins, I don't have to fight one and a half meter of hydrostatic pressure. I'm very close to the heart air, I can do it. Okay? So, if we look at the venous system, we really have to dissociate between three components. The splanchnic veins, that as we will see, are the dynamic regulator of return of blood to the heart. The deep limb veins that are the tubes that bring, you know, blood back from the biggest mass or limbs, mass, muscle. That's the biggest mass, fat too, in certain cases, but the biggest mass of the body. But they're relatively passive. Their problem is to fight against hydrostatic pressure. 
and make sure that not enough, not too much blood, for example, when we stand up, is pooled in the, in, the, in the lower limbs so that we don't bleed into our own veins, you see. And then there is a third component, the skin veins. And in humans, the skin veins have a very specific function. The skin veins, look at my veins today, I'm cold, you don't see them. The other day I was warm, you saw my veins. The veins, as we will see, are the radiators of our body. Their main function, they're long tubes under the skin and they irradiate heat. They are the way by which we exchange heat or get rid of heat, as we will see. Every biochemical reaction in our body generates heat. And we have to get rid of it because we want to keep, we'll see that later, our temperature constant. And the cutaneous veins, cutaneous blood vessels, but in particular the cutaneous veins are the main radiator to get rid of them. So functionally, we can subdivide Venus, the Venus system, into three parts. One relatively part, passive part, that is dominated by passive force. Those are the deep veins and the veins in skeletal muscle. Then an active part, the cutaneous veins, and those are mainly involved in temperature control, they contribute to some other things too. And then the dynamic component that will be hooked on to all the reflexes that we will describe tomorrow. Those are the regulator of the return of blood to the heart. You understand that? Okay. So the capacitance vessels constitute the reservoir of the circulation responsible for the moment-to-moment -moment adjustment of the return of blood to the heart to make sure that cardiac output can go on. But there's three components, very different. Okay. Why the veins can be such a wonderful and at the same time dangerous reservoir? And here there is another basic law of physics that you have to know, which is the law of Laplace. French scientist, long time ago. And what we are interested here is the relationship between wall tension, pressure, and radius. And it's a very simple relationship. That's the law governing the balloon. Have you, you've all have, uh, now they use he helium to do it, but when I was a kid if you wanted to blow up a balloon, you had to take a balloon and then when the diameter is very small, you know, you have to put a lot of pressure to get it out. And then progressively it becomes more easy. That's an inverse illustration of the Laplace's law. That means that, you know, the, the law says that for a given tension, that a given, the diameter and the pressure inside the elastic structure will determine the wall tension. Okay? Good. Now, thus, the degree of opening of an elastic tube and all our blood vessels are elastic tubes will be determined by the distending pressure, the local hydrostatic pressure, the local arterial pressure, the local venous pressure, and the wall tension. So if the wall tension is big, at the beginning of blowing the balloon, you will need a lot of pressure to make the diameter bigger, okay? And inversely. 
Now, if you look at the Venus wall, the characteristic of the Venus wall is that it is very elastic, very distensible. If you take here in this experiment, done on the jugular vein here in the neck, the one that people always cut in the bad movies, you see, the arteries and the veins here, okay? And you take a, a segment of that and you fill it progressively with blood or water, what you will see is that because it is very distensible, you have to put a lot of water before the pressure start, start building up. If you were to do the same with an artery, with a carotid artery, it would be like this here. Distensible, but much less. What does that mean? Well, that means that veins can absorb a lot of volume for very small changes in pressure. And this is one of the aspects of being a dynamic reservoir. It also means that for moderate increases in tension, we can push back a lot of fluid. It's an active container. You wouldn't want it to be too rigid or too stiff. wouldn't work to be active. Okay. Now, what determines the distensibility of the venous wall, of the capillary wall, of the arterial wall? The composition. You've seen that slide already several times. There are several structures here that contribute. Of course, the elastic connective tissues is a very important part. But also, the amount of smooth muscle. And the amount of smooth muscle will become very important because the distensibility of a blood vessel will be function not only of how much connective tissue and tissue per se there is, but also the degree of contraction of the smooth muscle. If those muscles contract, you know, it will be much harder to blow up the balloon. You understand? Good. And again, this is key, coming back to my little guy here that stands up. Because you understand the moment that we go in the morning, from here to there, we suddenly generate, you know, 90 millimeters of mercury pressure in the foot. What will the veins do? They will dilate. Now, if they all have the same composition, all veins will dilate. But there are differences, and I don't want you to even remember, but in terms of elastin, collagen, etc., there are differences in composition, and as the veins go down the leg, they become less distensible, so that they will accumulate less. So that's one way by which modern nature tries to prevent exaggerated pooling of blood in our feet, in our legs, when we stand up. There are other ways by which we can fight against that. And one of the most important ways is the existence that, unlike the arteries, the veins have valves. Again, if I talk to people with a minimum amount of engineering background, you know what a valve is in a pumping system. That's something that will open up in one direction and close in the other. That guarantees flow in one direction. Okay? We all understand that. Well, we have that in part of our circulation, the venous side. And actually, we use the word circulation. Do you know where that word comes from? From the guy who made this drawing, you know, William Harvey, who came to the conclusion that somehow the blood was going 
as it were in a circle. Before that, people believed that blood was ebbing and flowing, like the sea, you know, tides and... But he came to the conclusion, somehow, although they could not see the microcirculation, that came later with Leuvenhoek, you know, but they could not see the microcirculation. But he came to the conclusion that somehow it had to be circular. And that came from this very simple experiment done on arm veins, but you can do it on hand veins. You see, if I, my, my veins are a little cold, if I do this and stop here, the vein will fill up if I push here. If I do the reverse, it does not fill up. Why? Because they're valves, not blood, the venous blood goes toward the heart, but cannot flow back, theoretically. You understand? Now that's extremely important when we go back to my standing guy. Because that means that, you know, in all the veins of the lower limb, but also in the arm, that there are valves that will prevent the blood from returning. So the very large hydrostatic column that is created by standing up is broken into small segments of a few centimeters each by the valves. So that actually, if everything works, we will never have, under healthy condition, 100 or millimeters of mercury distending pressure in the veins of the foot. Because the valves close and the blood cannot flow back. Okay? And it's great. We will see when we talk about that later that this is great as long as we don't stand too still too long. Because as the blood pushes on the veins, it will slowly but surely distend them. And after a while, the valves will become incompetent. You know, they will open up a bit, so blood trickles down this one, and then this one, and then this one. And this, even if I'm perfectly healthy, which I hope I am, and my veins are good, if I stand still too long, progressively, the hydrostatic column will be established. And ultimately, after 20 minutes, half an hour, there will be one or two liters extra blood in my leg. Okay? But normally, if we move around, this is not much of a problem. Now, how can we compensate against that? But we're back to vascular smooth muscle and venous smooth muscle. One way to compensate for, those for the distension and the accumulation of blood is to use vasoconstrictor tone, venoconstrictor tone, to increase the contraction of the venous smooth muscle, which will make it much less distensible. And let me show you this experiment. And this is a very important slide for me because that was in my first real paper in 1969. A long, long time ago. My first big, long paper. And what I did, I took segments of veins, saphenous veins, from the dog in those days, we still was ethical to work on dogs. Now I would never do it anymore because I have dogs, I love dogs, and if I were to do experiments on dogs, my dogs would feel it and they wouldn't talk to me anymore. So I, I don't want to do experiments on dogs anymore. But, you know, so I took a segment of vein, I did exactly what I showed you before with the jugular vein and I progressively filled it up and measured the pressure that I generated. And I did that while the vein was relaxed, but also during stimulation of the sympathetic nerve. So I was mimicking the situation in the body where the sympathetic nerve sent signals to the vein to constrict. 
Do you see the difference? Now, my vein reacts as an artery. It's not distensible, really. Not very much. So, if the sympathetic nerves are working, we cannot accumulate so much blood. And this is the way we could defend ourselves. But we will see later today, if I get there, that that aspect of protection is made complicated by temperature changes. Because if I'm warm, you know, my veins will not be able to do that. So, the, this impact of hydrostatic pressure and passive changes in position are of main importance here in the deep veins of the limbs. The cutaneous veins can help a little bit, but they're dominated by temperature. And as I say, the splanking veins, because they're around the center of gravity, escape those problems. Okay, we've been around full circle. And I think I've tried to explain to you what the different components of the circulation are and how we can understand the specific function of those different components. The large arteries, the wind castle, to make, to permit a steady flow during the diastole, when the heart relaxes. The small precapillary arteries and arterioles, the faucets, that will change the diameter and thus the hydrostatic pressure in the capillaries. The capillaries, the exchanges, the big exchanges, active and passive, hydrostatic pressure, colloid osmotic pressure, transporters, no transporters, big holes, small holes, no holes. A whole array of possibilities. The veins, well, they bring it back to the heart, but they are, they are the active regulator of return of blood to the heart. Their life is made difficult because we stand up and we look you know, ahead of us. That makes life of the veins different and difficult, and we have to dissociate between those veins that can help the system the most, the splanking veins, and those veins that are a danger, you know, because they can accumulate too much blood. And the cutaneous veins, well, the radiator of the body will come back to that. So, now we're theoretically are ready to start talking about regulation of vascular tone. I've been saying on and off, well, the muscle will contract, the muscle will relax, this will do this, this will do that. How is that now regulated? Well, well, the crucial thing is that ultimately all changes in diameter, active changes in diameter, and thus all active changes in capillary exchanges are regulated by changes in tone of the vascular smooth muscle cells. Those little cells will contract the diameter of the blood vessel at the precapillary level and there's the exchanges as I explained this morning at the venous side of the circulation the vascular smooth muscle will regulate the distensibility of the wall and thus the return of blood to the heart so smooth muscle cells are the answer now, how do the smooth muscle cells know what they have to do? Well, you wouldn't believe how many factors are involved. And this slide summarizes the most important ones. And ultimately, the poor vascular smooth muscle cells have to add it all up and decide what I do. But that's the same for neurons in the brain. It's the same for all active cells in our body. They are bombarded with information and ultimately 
They have to make the summation and decide. In the case of vascular smooth muscle, I relax or I contract. Okay? Now, what are the signals for that? Well, the most important ones are most important not in order of importance. Let's just go through the list and tell you. We'll then come back to each one of them later. Important are signals from nerve endings. Or maybe I should go back. Hmm? So those smooth muscle here ha will ultimately carry out the messages. And the messages can come from here or can come from there. The nerves are usually at the outside. Of course, everything in the blood comes from there. So, neurotransmitter. Do you know what a neurotransmitter is? We will see that later on, that nerve endings release a chemical, and it's the chemical that carries the message. That chemical we call a neurotransmitter, because it transmits the message from a neuron, from a nerve cell. And there are several that we will discuss. Do you know what hormones are? Those are products of glands in the body, that are secreted in the blood and that are pumped around the body and can work everywhere. Do you see the difference between the two? Nerve endings we will control very specifically. Hormones, it's an overall thing. Hmm? Okay. Doesn't mean that every blood vessel participates, we'll see exceptions to that. Platelet products and blood products in the blood we haven't said anything about the blood, but it's a wonderful juice. It contains all kinds of things. It contains cells, it contains platelets, and those cells and platelets can generate signals for vascular smooth muscles. They also, the blood can coagulate, and when it coagulates, it will form thrombin, and that can be a very powerful signal too. Endothelial cells. They are a wonderful generator of a number of signals, and because this is the area of research that I have spent the last 30 years on, we will devote more time to the endothelium, because I want to, I want to teach you, I want to show you how a question in science progressed from a very simple observation to a very complex and fascinating story. And I will share that with you, my 30 years in the endothelium. Hmm? Histamine, bradykinine, you already know those. I mentioned histamine and I showed you what bradykinine does. And ultimately, you know, when that fluid was popping out in the tissue, this was in part a consequence of the vascular smooth muscle of the arterial dilating. Remember, that was why it became red. We will talk about the composition of the fluid. You know? very important. And we will also talk about the physical factors. So we can dissociate between local factors, substances that are produced by other cells in the blood vessel wall, this is what we call autocoids, blood components, endocrine glands, and nerves. And this will be our progression for the lectures, the rest of the lecture today and the, and the lecture tomorrow. And hopefully at the end of tomorrow we will be here. I hope so, because that would be good to finish that. Local factors. Okay, look at my, and now we're talking about the surrounding of the vascular smooth muscle cells. So they're in the blood vessel wall. They are like all cells fed from the blood somehow or somewhere and they have the composition of the fluid around them. Well, the physical composition 
of that fluid is crucial. And one of the very important one is the amount of oxygen. If you take a vascular smooth muscle here, we'll explain later why that is, but if we take a vascular smooth muscle in isolation, we make it to contract with the vasoconstrictor, it doesn't matter what, and then we, so it contracts, the artery is constricting, and then we switch off the oxygen. We see that the smooth muscle relaxes. A key response. Because that means that if there is too little oxygen in that part, around that particular arterial, well, that's not good. You know, the cells need oxygen. It will automatically relax. That's a basic response in vascular smooth muscles. We'll come back to it. The same with pH. You know what pH is? That's the concentration, it's you know, the, the amount of hydrogen ions that are in the extracellular fluid. Now, our body is geared to work as an organism at an optimal pH of about 7.4. You can ask Professor Dongbei, she, know, she knows much more about pH than I do. You know? so, 7.4. And there is a whole system to maintain that through the kidney, respiration, etc. I have no time to go into that. But ultimately, we want pH to be constant. Now, as we work, maybe it's that the next one? No. I will come back to it. If we change the pH, the vascular smooth muscle will react. This is another one of my experiments when I was your age. What's going on here? I was taking blood vessels and changing from an acidic pH 7 to pH 8, and you could see that simply illustrating that if it becomes less acidic, the smooth muscle contract. If it becomes more acidic, it relaxes. And we can do a more sophisticated experiment and show that if we go through a pH range and we look at the response uh, to electricals to nerve stimulation, whether we change the pH by metabolic factors, that is by changing the bicarbonate concentration, <coughs> or respiratory factors by changing the CO2, there is a very strict dependency of them. Why is that important? Well, one of the consequences of the activities of tissues, you know, when cells become active, particularly muscle cells, they will generate hydrogen ions, that they will pump outside the cell. Yeah. Very, there is a very effective way to do that. Because we don't want the intracellular milieu to be acidic. So we pump out the hydrogen ions. If we work and generate energy, we will use oxygen. We will generate more CO2. CO2 more CO2 will make it also acidotic. So from the two things that I've told you already, you know that this is something that vascular smooth muscles will not like. And there are other things, osmolarity, adenosine, I don't want to talk about that right now. But as a consequence, if a muscle cell becomes active, the composition of the extracellular fluid will change drastically and the blood vessel will open up. This is a key response, because that, you can understand, links arterial or tone to the degree of activity of the tissue. This means that my tissue becomes active, whether it be a brain, a gut, doesn't matter. My arterioles will open up, 
the faucet opens up and if I maintain blood pressure constant there will be enough blood going to the tissues you understand that all of you that's a crucial local regulation a basic one one of the most essential ones. less oxygen more CO2 more pH and you know more hydrogen ions we open up the faucet okay and this the slide, I won't explain the slide, it doesn't matter. Although shock would interest Professor Dunman Wu very much, but it's an old experiment by a Swedish friend. The only thing I wanted is to remind me to tell you, and this is the first time I've already alluded to that during the break. Whatever I tell you is true for the blood vessel I'm talking about at that time. There is no general rule. For example, if we compare the responses that I just mentioned between peripheral veins and peripheral arterioles, the arterioles are very sensitive to changes in pH, pCO2, etc., and lowering of PO2. The veins are not. Does that make sense? Well, coming back to the comment that you made during the break. You know, we have 75% of our venous blood in the veins. Blood is not fully oxygenated anymore in the veins. We don't want the veins to dilate further. We want them to be resistant to changes in PCO2 and pH and oxygen because the blood that comes from the periphery will not be of good quality from that point of view. So we want them to be resistant up to the bitter end you know, to that. Illustrating again how we adapt and adjust. So at the pre-capillary side, metabolic changes are crucial. At the post-capillary side, they are much less crucial, much less important. Okay, we will talk about calcium and activation when we talk about vascular smooth muscle in the next lecture. No, I think that's too soon. What about physical? So calcium is crucial, and but we will discuss it, uh, believe me, in more detail. Not this visit, but next visit. Physical. What are the most important physical factors? Well, this slide says it all stretch pressure and temperature. And if we look at physical factors, we need, besides temperature, to consider three aspects. Compression, internal distension, and shear force. Okay, external compression. This slide, and I've already said something like that in the first lecture. This slide shows you, if you look at a human who is exercising the calf, the lower leg, and you measure blood flow through that leg, this would be the blood flow during contraction. So it's not a sustained contraction, but it's a rhythmic contraction of like this. Hmm? And you measure blood flow during contractions. And this is the blood flow in between contractions. You see the difference? Remember what I told you about the heart? Diastolic pressure versus systolic pressure. Yeah. The in a skeletal muscle, during the contraction, the wall of the muscle, the muscle stiffens so much that it compresses the blood vessels and it cannot receive enough blood. This is why we can do this forever, but if we hang from a tree, sooner or later, we will have to give up. 
because the pain will be too intense. Illustrating that. So compression is an external physical factor that can do cause a problem in terms of the arrival of blood to the tissue. And we have to keep that into consideration. But it can be good for certain things. And we're back to a little guy standing there with the blood pooled in the deep veins, in the veins within the muscle of the legs. Here we measure, not me, but those investigate, measure blood pressure in a guy, little guy standing still at the foot. Pressure is very high. 90 millimeters of mercury. Actually, this is the paper from which the figure came that I quoted on my little guy standing up. Now the guy starts doing this. Compressing the deep veins. Blood immediately can start flowing from the skin veins into the deep veins and back to the heart. As long as he keeps doing this, no problem. The moment he stops up, we go back. What does that mean? Well, again, as I told you, when we stand up and stay still, our valves will become incompetent. Now, we will accumulate. Blood. Now, only if we stand still. And does this only becomes a problem for people who have to stand still a long time? Teachers, nurses, surgeons, girls or boys in shops, you see. And those are the people that are at danger for something that we will discuss. I don't do not today, I think I, I forgot where that we discuss, you know, when we talk briefly about varicose veins because those professions will predispose for that. Okay. Good. So external distension uh, compression is important. What about internal distension? Well, if you look back and you think about Laplace's law that we started with, the distension of the blood vessel will be function of wall tension and pressure. There is this relationship. So what will make a blood vessel distend? An increase in pressure, okay? Now that has consequences. If you look at the vascular smooth muscle, and again, we talk about vascular smooth muscle here. If we look at vascular smooth muscle, those little guys are arranged in circular manner. But they are muscle cells. And as we will see, they contract between, because they have contractile proteins that can interact and slide it to each other and pull. Now, how can distension affect that? Well, when I was young, if we wanted to impress girls, we were showing off our muscle. Mm -hmm. Hmm? And how do you show off your muscle? You just put your arm in a very particular position and then you do this. What have you done? You have, without realizing, selecting the point where the contractile proteins are optimally arranged so that their interaction can be optimal when your muscle shows up. If I do this, I've elongated them. They're too far apart. Here, elongation. This would be the optimum. If I completely do like this, I cannot generate power. Thus, the physical arrangement of the contractile protein 
will determine how hard the viscous smooth muscle cell actually can pull. You understand that? And you've already seen that in a way, but let me illustrate it here with another blood vessel here. That's a splanchnic vein. Remember what the splanchnic veins were supposed to be? The dynamic reservoir to the heart. Now, if you take a splanchnic vein and you progressively, that splanchnic vein is spontaneously active. It kind of tends spontaneously to help the blood to go back to the heart. Now, if we take that splanchnic vein, another one of my experiments when I was younger than you, no, about your age, you see that as I distend the vein, it becomes better and better. Thus, this splanchnic pumping of blood towards the heart will become better if there is more blood in the splanchnic area. Make that makes sense. Now we make making sense. More distension will be better to push it back to the heart. And uh, didn't I have another slide here? Yeah. Back to my little guy here. It's the same thing. If we look at the veins here, have you seen that slide already? This vein is progressively distended. So the contractile proteins are progressively from unloaded to elongated. What you have to look at here is the difference. This is totally unloaded. No contraction. Here is beginning to be stretched. The contraction becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. Optimal interaction between the proteins. And then here we begin to elongate too much the reaction becomes smaller and smaller. Each vascular smooth muscle, each <coughs> blood vessel, has a specific configuration that will permit the optimal interaction of the contractile proteins. That's purely physical. But on top of that, Sometimes, stretch can generate a signal for the vascular smooth muscle. And this is illustrated here in an experiment involving the endothelium, so I will come back to that. But in that experiment, we took a ring of artery and we suddenly stretched it. You see, don't make those other things that, I, that we used in the past. And we suddenly stretched it. And here, it's a ring without endothelium. This is the first time I think that I show you that the endothelium is important. You believe me, you will hear more about it. Hmm? Hmm? But here is a blood vessel without endothelium. And I suddenly stretch it. It reacts like a rubber band. That is, when I stretch it, there is a very rapid increase in tension physical, but then it's an elastic structure. If this were steel, it would stay there. It's not steel. So it's elastic, so we have hysteresis, physical concept of an elastic fabric, and progressively the tension decays to reach a new equilibrium. If we have the endothelium, we see that rather than this immediate relaxation, we have a contraction that is sustained for several minutes. I want you to remember that. Not, you know, we'll come back to that when we talk about the endothelium. Because this response to constrict in face of a sudden increase in this tension is very important because it explains what we call autoregulation. I told you we operate on the principle that the water tower keeps constant. Okay? That's fine. 
So our arterial blood pressure most of the time remains the same. But sometimes we need more pressure. If we really start running, you know, we now suddenly are talking about 50 kilograms of muscle that need more blood, and the only way to get them enough blood is to increase the perfusion pressure. Yet, at the same time, we don't want to do that everywhere. And particularly in our black box, or in the kidney, we don't want to do that. Because the black box, why? Well, because the black box is fragile. And if the pressure suddenly increases too much, we could rupture blood vessels and lose part of the brain. And the kidney is important, we want to run, but if our kidney is overperfused, we, we will start making so much urine, you know, that we will have stopped running to take a pee. Yeah? So we don't want to do that either. So those circulations in particular have what we call autoregulation. That is that if the blood vessel is closed and we increase perfusion pressure, there will be an increase in diameter, caliber, the diameter. Then throughout a range of pressures, the diameter will not change. And only if the blood pressure becomes very exaggerated will the blood vessel then distend. And this autoregulation protects the brain circulation against unwanted, exaggerated bursts of blood pressure. That is a very important response. And this is due to something like this. The fact that if you stretch certain smooth muscle, certain blood vessel that will automatically constrict you know, to prevent exaggerated increases in pressure downstream. We understand that? Okay. Now this I've already covered. Okay. Of the physical factors, probably one of the most important ones are shear force. Do you know what shear force is? Can you imagine you have a tube, you have blood, and as blood flows, it shears along the blood vessel wall and loses energy. Okay? Now, the shear forces will augment if the flow becomes bigger, you know, or if the composition of the fluid becomes thicker. Hmm? Agreed? We all can understand that. You know, if you take a syringe and you try to push a solution through it, if it is water, it's very easy. If it is oil, you have to push, you see. So illustrating that more shear forces are lost in that case. And of course, if you push harder, you, know, you will generate more shear force. And this brings us again to the endothelium because I maybe I should explain that when I talk about the endothelium because this is going to go too far. The experiment that I wanted to show is simply illustrating that if, just listen to me, don't look at the picture, I'll explain it later. If flow increases through a blood vessel, the shear forces will Prickle, tickle the endothelial cells, and the endothelial cells will take, will tell the surrounding smooth muscle to relax. And this happens in the large arteries. And let me now try to explain to you why this is important, and I'll stop there for today. You have a blood vessel, a large blood vessel that feeds a muscle bed. The muscles suddenly start working. What will happen? Well, we've seen it. All of this will happen, and the arterioles 
will dilate. The blood pressure hopefully remains the same, so there will be a sudden surge of blood to the working tissue. Everybody understands that? Now, at that time, in the large tubes that go to the tissue, the shear forces tell, by way of the endothelium, tell the smooth muscle of the large tube to relax. So the big conduit vessels, the big arteries, relax also. In reaction to what happens downstream, that is as if in your bathroom, when you open the tap, the faucet to your bath, the tubes in the wall would suddenly become bigger. Do you understand that? That makes the redirection of blood flow to the active tissue very efficient. Much more than if everything would stay the same. And thus, shear stress is a very important factor for the regulation of vascular tone. And of course it is very important because we have shear stress in every blood vessel of our body all the time. We'll come back to that when we talk about the endothelium. The other physical factor that is of great importance is temperature. But that slide, which is one of my slides too, I will explain tomorrow morning then. I'll see you tomorrow morning and please keep this little pink stick here so that I'm sure that I have a lecture, that I have material.